right. What a, what a great time of worship together. Uh, I just want to give you just one quick uh, update. Um, our worship pastor is in Michigan now, and so uh, my brother Dave and, and Becky and Oliver and Eloise, they got in late, late uh, Friday night. Uh, I saw them yesterday, um, was able to give them uh, the keys to the house that they'll be staying in. And God has been so faithful throughout this whole process. Um, uh, they still haven't sold their home in Florida, and so they're uh, completely removed from the situation, and now, obviously, God's going to have to do the whole thing. Um, and uh, what's a house to God, right? He, all it takes is one buyer, and uh, they're uh, needing to sell their house so they can find uh, their home here, which is what they're anxious to do. Um, but what's really remarkable is uh, the pastor from Cornerstone Baptist Church, Pastor Nate, um, can't remember his last name right now, it's slipping my mind, but their church has a, 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 a house on their property, a parsonage that they have fixed up quite nicely, and uh, back when, um, when Carrie and I, we had sold our house and we had to be out of our, out of our old house at a certain date, we haven't, we haven't found a house yet, this pastor from Cornerstone offered this place for Carrie and me and our kids to stay free of charge. And, uh, you know, God provided us a place, so we didn't need that. So I thought, well, what about my brother? What about Dave and Becky and their family? So I reached out to Pastor Nate, and uh, the church is so gracious, so generous. They were like, we would love to have your brother stay with us. And he's like, they can, they can stay here for up to three months if they need won't cost them a dime. So uh, God faithfully provided for them through that church. So um, just so thankful for Pastor Nate and the people over at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And so um, that's where they're going to be until they sell their home. And this, um, this temporary home is certainly uh, something that meets a need. Um, I went into it, I got to be honest, I went into it um, last week, I got the keys. I did a walkthrough. There was another family staying there. I was a little scared at first because, I mean, it was things were everywhere in this home. And I got out. I'm like, I can't have my brother stay there. And, and, uh, and uh, so I talked to my brother about it. He goes, you know what? This is, this is God's provision. It's going to meet a need. And uh, so the, the people that were staying there, they left. And on Saturday morning, I went over with my brother um, to give him the keys to the house. We opened the house. That house was so clean, so picked up, so inviting. So it's going to work out well for them. Um, but just be praying. Um, Becky's parents and brother came out with them, and uh, they dropped uh, Becky's brother Chris off at the airport today. So he's flying back to West Palm, and I believe Becky's parents leave tomorrow. Very, very difficult goodbyes. So just continue to pray for them as they, uh, as they work through that. Um, but they're here. They're so excited to be here. And uh, we'll be seeing a lot more of them in the weeks to come. All right? So thank you for your prayers. They really appreciate it. Um, at this time, we're going to get into the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Um, man, we're really flying through the Gospel of Mark, right? Twelve weeks, we are in chapter 3. And we're just starting chapter 3. Um, Mark is laying out for his readers proof, evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Uh, Mark is declaring that truth in his gospel through the personal testimony of the eyewitness Peter. Okay, Mark is, is basing his, this historical account of Jesus' life and ministry on the things that Peter saw and heard when he was with Jesus for three and a half years. And just keep in mind, though, that long before the days of Peter and Mark, the Jews had been waiting for the Messiah to come. His arrival was anticipated in the very beginning of the Old Testament, ever since Genesis chapter 3, when God promised to uh, send His Son to crush the serpent's head, Okay, that was way back in Genesis 3.15 with Adam and Eve. And so the, the anticipation for the Messiah's arrival had been building ever since then. In fact, when you get to the very end of the Old Testament, the Jews are still eagerly waiting. 
Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, last book of the Old Testament, God says to Israel, Behold, I am sending my messenger. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, fast forward a little more than 400 years, and Messiah finally arrives. Jesus is born, the Lord had suddenly come, and what did the Jews do? They rejected Jesus. John 1.11 says that Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And the ones who rejected Jesus the most and the loudest were the guys who were supposed to be the most excited and the biggest advocates for the Messiah, and that's the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They were supposed to be the leading experts in all things Messiah-related, and yet when the Messiah arrives, they hate him. No one hated Jesus more than the Pharisees. And one of the reasons is because Jesus taught a message that was completely opposite of their message. Mark 1.14 tells us that Jesus proclaimed the gospel of God. Jesus' message was the gospel, euangelion, it means the good news. And the good news of the gospel is that a sinner is saved by grace. It's the good news that forgiveness and eternal life are made available to every sinner who turns away from their sin and comes to Jesus by faith. You see, Jesus taught a very inclusive message. Whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever can believe in Jesus. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Whoever can come to Jesus. Jesus taught a salvation that's available to whoever, to all who repent and believe in Him, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, man, woman, young, old. Salvation is a free gift of God's grace to all who believe. That message was in direct conflict with the Pharisees' message. Their message of Judaism, which centered on works, not grace. The Pharisees preached to get to heaven, to be with God, you got to earn your spot. Right? you gotta, you got to work your way in. The Pharisees said, behave. Jesus said, believe. The Pharisees said, rules. Jesus said, repent. The Pharisees said, earn it. Jesus said, receive it. The Pharisees preached a works-based system. Jesus taught a grace-based salvation. The Pharisees taught traditions. Jesus taught truth. And so when tax collectors and sinners like Matthew, you know, we talked about him in Mark chapter 2, when the dregs of society like Matthew were called to Jesus and, and, and were following him, the Pharisees were outraged, right? Heaven's not for those kinds of people. That's what the Pharisees thought. They thought they thought that the kingdom of God was for religious people, moral people. Well, they were wrong. Heaven's for forgiven people. And to be forgiven, you have to admit you're a sinner and ask for forgiveness, which is something the Pharisees would never do because because you know they were they were pure, they were holy. On the outside, they cleaned up real nice. They followed the law. They even added all these extra rules and regulations to make sure that they weren't even close to breaking the law. They committed no outward acts of adultery or murder. They thought they were a shoe-in to God's kingdom. But then Jesus shows up and he says, guys, it's not about the externals. It's not about outward appearance. It's about your heart. God's not impressed with your behavior, his focus is, is what's on the inside. And so, so Jesus said in his famous Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5, he, he says, you, you have heard it said, you shall not commit murder, but I say to you that anyone who hates his brother is guilty of murder. And you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who lustfully looks at a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus was making the point that true holiness, pure righteousness, it starts here. It's your heart. It's who you are. You see, you have to be made righteous, not just act righteous. The Pharisees, it was all an act. They, they acted like righteous people, but in their hearts, they were full of hate, 
which made them murderers. In their hearts, they were full of lust, which made them adulterers. And, and listen, we're not any better, okay? We're not any better. I don't care how, how nice you clean up on the outside. Inside, there's some greed and selfishness and bitterness and pride. True or false? True. Like, I, I know it's true of me. So listen, real Righteousness, the kind that makes us acceptable and pleasing to God, the kind of righteousness that gets us to heaven, that cannot be earned by any amount of external moral deeds done by us. Rather, true and perfect righteousness is a gift from God that's imputed to us the moment we put our faith in Jesus for our salvation. Jesus takes away our sin, and in the place where our sin used to be, we are given Jesus' perfect righteousness. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God that depends on faith in order that I may know Him. Guys, in order to know the perfectly righteous and holy God, in order to have a personal relationship with Him, I must have a perfect and holy righteousness myself. The problem is all my outward righteous deeds are filthy in God's sight because of, because of all the inward wickedness lurking in my heart. My righteous deeds are filthy because of my selfish motives and my greedy intentions and my lustful thoughts. So what I need in order to know God, it's, it's not a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. No, I need a perfect and pure righteousness and that can only be found in Jesus. And my sin is replaced with Jesus' righteousness through faith. That is it. Right? Any righteousness I bring to the table on my own, it's flawed. A lot of times it's phony and it's fake, and that's the Pharisees, religious phonies. That was the title of last week's sermon. Do you remember that? Last week we, we learned that the Pharisees were, were super critical of Jesus and his disciples because they weren't following any of their man-made, extra-biblical, legalistic, Sabbath-day rules. Keep in mind, the only thing God said about the Sabbath day was to remember it and keep it holy, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. God designed the Sabbath to be a day of rest and worship in order to renew the whole person. Rest, of course, would renew your body. Worship would renew your soul. Rest and worship. And yet the Pharisees came up with this big, long list. They attached all these additional rules to what God had already said. And then they began to judge everybody else on how closely they prescribed to the extra rules. Here's what John MacArthur says about it. The Pharisees overlaid laws upon laws, rituals upon routines, rules upon restrictions, and requirements upon restraints. Do you remember some of the things the Pharisees said you weren't allowed to do on the Sabbath? We talked about this last week. Uh, the Pharisees said um, you can't take a bath on the Sabbath. You can't take a bath on the Sabbath because you might spill water, then you have to wipe it up, which means you'd be washing your floor, and that's work. No work on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees said, no looking in the mirror on the Sabbath because if you did, you might see a gray hair, and then you'd be tempted to pluck it out, and that's, that's too much work on the Sabbath. The Pharisees said on the Sabbath, you, you cannot carry anything that weighs more than a dried fig, which is half an ounce. So don't pick up a book, a pen, a golf club, the remote, right? Put the remote down. No Sunday afternoon football for you. The Pharisee said you can only, you can only travel uh, 3,000 feet from your home on, on the Sabbath. They even went as far as counting the steps, 1,999 steps, not one step more. This one's really ridiculous. No, no spitting on the Sabbath. Don't spit. Because your loogie might hit the dirt and cause an indentation. And the Pharisee said that equates to digging a hole. And that's work. 
And so what God intended as a blessing for his people, a time of rest and renewal and refreshment, the Pharisees turned that divine blessing into a dreaded burden with all of their rules and routines and restrictions. And Jesus called them out on this. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, Jesus He said about the Pharisees, he said, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. Where we left off last time, we finished up chapter 2, and in the very last verse, Jesus looks the Pharisees straight in the eye, and he says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I am Lord of the Sabbath. That was very significant for two reasons. Number one, God created the Sabbath in Genesis chapter 2 when he rested on the seventh day after creating the universe in six days. And so for Jesus to say, I am Lord of the Sabbath, what's he saying? That he's God, right? I am, I am Lord of the Sabbath is a clear claim to deity. And secondly, Jesus is telling the Pharisees, because I'm Lord of the Sabbath, I make the rules, not you. I said last week that the Pharisees' issue wasn't with the rules, it's who makes the rules, and Jesus settled that. It's not you guys, your rules mean nothing, I'm in charge. I make the rules, and the rules are rest and worship. Rest and worship. So all your 347 additional rules about spitting and bathing and walking and plucking and lifting and working, they mean nothing. The Pharisees thought their rules were everything. The Pharisees thought that their adherence to their rules made them better than everybody and pleasing to God. And when God in the flesh said to them, out with your rules, the Pharisees lost it. And in our next passage, we're going to see their hatred boil over to the point of now wanting to kill Jesus. Up until now, the Pharisees had been questioning Jesus, debating Jesus, arguing with Jesus. From here on out, they're making plans to murder Jesus. So as we get into our passage in Mark 3, let me just give you a little bit of context here. The passage we studied last week, which was Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, what what happened there with, with Jesus getting into it with the Pharisees about the Sabbath, this is very closely connected to Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Most scholars believe Mark 3, 1 through 6 occurred the very next Sabbath after Mark 2, 23 through 28. So these two events, they're a week apart, but on the same day. The the Sabbath day, the day the Pharisees loved the most because on that day they could parade and flaunt their self-righteous behavior in front of everybody. Mark Now Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, uh, that took place in the country. You remember Jesus and his disciples were, were walking through a grain field that was in the country. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, takes place in church, the synagogue. But again, in both cases, it was the Sabbath. All right, so let's get into it. Mark 3, look at verse 1. Again, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue. Now, keep in mind, Jesus is somewhere in Galilee at this point. We don't know the exact city. The text doesn't tell us. All we do know is he's in a synagogue, their, their, their local church there. It's, it's Sabbath day, and Jesus is worshiping in the synagogue. According to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 6, we're, we're told there that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, which no surprise there. Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 38, Jesus said to his disciples, Come, let's go over to the other towns that I may teach there also, for that is why I came. Jesus taught wherever he went, and wherever Jesus went, there were crowds, and every single crowd that heard Jesus teach, they were blown away. Mark chapter 1, verse 22 says that that the people were astonished at Jesus' teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. See, the scribes, here's what they taught. They taught what other scribes before them taught. See, the scribes preached the ideas and opinions of previous scribes. Jesus actually opened up the Word and taught the truth. 
And, and what Jesus pulled out from the Word was the opposite of what people were hearing from the scribes and the Pharisees. See, Jesus taught about repentance and faith, not about rules and traditions. That was a, a different message, the gospel message. Jesus preached salvation by grace through faith. Jesus did not pull out a, a big, long list of extra-biblical rules and, and burden the people. And so as a result, Luke 19.48 says that people were hanging on to every word Jesus Jesus said. And I love that. I love that. Listen to me. Jesus taught the word, the gospel, and the crowds gathered and hung on to his every word. That, that reassures me that when we come together, when we gather in this place, the word of God should be enough for us. Okay? If the word is being taught, that should be enough. Today, some churches are placing a greater emphasis on entertainment rather than exposition. And those churches are a mile wide and an inch deep. Other churches today are placing a greater emphasis on politics rather than preaching, and those churches are distracted and divided. Some churches are placing a greater emphasis on tradition rather than truth. Those churches are deceived and dying. Okay, how about this? Let's be a church, guys, let's be a church that keeps the emphasis on exposition, preaching, truth. Let's just go with this. Preach the word. Is that enough? It's enough for Jesus. That's what he taught. And he's doing it right here in Mark chapter 3. And there was somebody in the crowd. Verse 1 says that there was a man who was there that had a withered hand. Again, Luke in his gospel says that it was the guy's right hand that was withered. See, Luke's a doctor. It's very detailed, very thorough. He tells us which hand it was. It was the guy's right hand. Now, most people are uh, right-handed or left-handed. What do you think? Right-handed, right? That seems to be the more dominant hand for most people. And so if this guy was, was, was like the majority and he was right-handed, but his right hand, his dominant hand was withered, that's a problem. This guy can't do a whole lot. The word withered in verse 1 speaks of atrophy or a wasting away. The guy's right hand was lifeless, dead. So think about it, he's in church, he's at the synagogue worshiping, and in those days during prayer time it was custom to raise your hands. Do you think he was embarrassed to raise his? I do, especially since everybody in those days thought that chronic disease and disability that was a direct result from some secret sin in your life. If you need proof of this, there's the, the guy in John chapter 9 who was blind and the disciples pointed at the guy and asked Jesus, why is he blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents? So no doubt people in that synagogue looked at that man with the withered hand and thought, well, he's getting what he deserves and God must be punishing him for his sin. This, this poor guy, if, if being disabled isn't hard enough, he's got to put up with accusation and condemnation. And, and not only that, but what job is he going to get? Right? If, you're, if your strong hand is dead, how are you going to work? How are you going to do manual labor? And if you can't work, how are you going to earn a living? You beg, that's how. He, he was reduced to begging. Now, as bad as all that is, let me just ask you this. Is this guy's condition fatal? Is his life on the line right now? Yes or no? No. Okay, he's got, he's got a disabled hand, nothing life-threatening. So on a scale of one to five, one being, you know, it can wait a little bit, five being we don't have a second to spare, on a scale of one to five, how urgent is it that Jesus heal this guy? A one, maybe a two, Guy's not going to die. Jesus can deal with the withered hand after the Sabbath. But we're going to see that is not what Jesus does. He's going to heal this guy right then and there, and he does it to make a point. Jesus purposefully, willingly, deliberately heals this guy in the synagogue on the Sabbath because that went against the Pharisees' unbiblical, unnecessary Sabbath day rules. 
See, another one of their, uh, another one of their stupid Sabbath day restrictions centered around how much care a sick person could receive on the Sabbath. The Pharisees said that if you were to uh, come alongside of, of somebody who was sick and, and you were to do something to improve their physical condition, that's work and therefore a violation of the Sabbath. If somebody came up to you and they were sick, all you could do for them was just maintain the status quo, just keep them alive. But as soon as the Sabbath was over, that's when you could actually treat the person. In fact, one of my commentaries mentioned that rabbis advise not even visiting the sick on the Sabbath because the Sabbath was supposed to be a day marked by joy. How cruel is that? The Pharisees' mindset was, heal any other day, just not today. You got, you got six days out of the week to do good, but not on the Sabbath. We won't stand for that. And so, the Pharisees, of course, they were, they were in the synagogue that day with Jesus. Trust me, they weren't there to worship. They were there to war. If anybody's a Sabbath day violator, it's the Pharisees. They're busy, at work, plotting and scheming. They're not worshiping, I can tell you that much. They were watching Jesus. Look at verse 2. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. The Pharisees weren't watching Jesus to learn from him. They wanted to label him. They were hoping to label Jesus a lawbreaker. This is what legalists do. Legalists are always on the lookout for what's wrong in a person's life, never for what's right. They're watching Jesus. They want to see him slip up. If Jesus healed the guy, they would say he was a, a Sabbath day violator. The, the Pharisees cared nothing for the man with the withered hand. They had no compassion for him at all. All they cared about was condemning Jesus. So again, verse 2, they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Now, let's just think about this for a second. What are the chances, what are the chances this guy with the withered hand shows up to the same synagogue on the same day as Jesus? Is it possible that the Pharisees planted this guy there as a trap? What do you think? I, listen, I don't put anything past the Pharisees. They are evil people. They know Jesus has a reputation for healing the sick. And so if they plant this guy with the withered hand in front of Jesus in the synagogue, chances are he's going to heal him, which in a way is a compliment to Jesus. Right? The Pharisees are showcasing Jesus' love and compassion for people without even meaning to. And so if Jesus did what they thought he would do, which is heal this man out of compassion, then they would say that Jesus was a Sabbath day lawbreaker. I, on, I honestly think this whole thing was a setup. I, I, I honestly think they planted the guy with the withered hand in the synagogue, and they just sat there watching, hoping to accuse Jesus. Which, let me ask you, was Jesus, was Jesus aware of what they were up to? Yeah, Jesus misses nothing. He knew what was in their hearts. The end of John chapter 2 says that Jesus didn't need anyone to bear witness about man because he himself knew what's in man. In fact, Luke chapter 6 verse 8 comes right out and says Jesus knew what they were thinking. Jesus knows what the Pharisees are up to and instead of fleeing the conflict, Jesus faces right up into it. See, Jesus is not a victim. He's sovereign. He's completely in control of this situation. He is completely in control of every situation. He knows what's going on. He knows what he's going to do. Guys, you need to understand, Jesus is, is not only the Lord of this particular Sabbath in Mark chapter 3, he is the Lord of every Sabbath and every day in between. All right, look, look at verse 3. And, and, and Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Okay, who made contact with who? Who reached out to who? Was it Jesus with the man or the man with Jesus? It's Jesus initiated everything. Here, here was a guy who was shunned by society, used by the Pharisees. Again, he, he desperately needed love and compassion, and Jesus initiates exactly that with this guy. Jesus said to the man, verse 3, Jesus said to the man with a withered hand, come here. So what did the guy do? How did he respond? 
In the same way, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew responded. When Jesus said to them, follow me, they immediately got up and followed him. Remember, guys, Jesus spoke as one who had authority, absolute authority. And so when he says to this guy, come here, the guy immediately gets up and comes to Jesus. See, just the way people respond to Jesus' commands in the Gospels is proof that Jesus is God who has divine authority. Look look at verse 4. So Jesus and the guy with the withered hand, they're in front of the synagogue. They're standing there so everybody can see. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, verse 4, and he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? How obvious is that answer? I mean, if you have the opportunity to do good or, or to save a life, which is the ultimate good, if you have the opportunity to do that, no matter what day of the week it is, do it. Right? Do it. John Phillips puts it this way, should a man stand by and watch his neighbor's house burn down without so much as lifting a finger to help just because it's the Sabbath? Is that what God intended? Should a doctor refuse to treat a child who has fallen and broken his leg just because it's the Sabbath? Should a man stand on the riverbank and watch someone drown when he could rescue him just because it's the Sabbath? The answer is obvious. No. Right? If you have the opportunity to do good and help somebody in need, do it regardless of the day. Just do it. And Jesus' question to the Pharisees is perfect. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm? To kill, to save a life, or to kill? See, guys, the Pharisees knew what the law said. The Old Testament clearly commands people to do good, and it clearly prohibits people from doing harm. They knew that, and yet what they were doing on the Sabbath was bringing harm to people with all of their strict, impossible Sabbath day standards that they forced on everybody. They're the lawbreakers, not Jesus. Not only that, but, but the Pharisees' attitude towards those who were hurting, towards those who were suffering, like, like this guy with the withered hand, the Pharisees couldn't care less about him. Their goal was to harm Jesus, not help the sick. Instead of doing good on the Sabbath, the Pharisees were responsible for doing a lot of harm to a lot of people. And instead of saving life on the Sabbath, the Pharisees were now seeking to take a life, and that's the life of Jesus. They were trying to trap Jesus so they could accuse him of breaking the Sabbath so they could put him to death. Guys, the Pharisees have hate in their heart. They have murder on their mind. Again, who here is the real lawbreaker? It's the Pharisees. They were doing the opposite of what God wants. We learned last week that God wants compassion, not sacrifice. Listen to these verses from Isaiah chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 11. You don't have to turn here. Just listen. It's a, it's a lengthy passage. God says this, I am sick of your sacrifices. Don't bring me any more burnt offerings. I don't want the fat from your rams or other animals. I don't want to see the blood from your offerings of bulls and rams and goats. Why do you keep parading through my court with your worthless sacrifices? The incense you bring me is a stench to my nostrils. Your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath day and your special days of fasting, even your most pious meetings are all sinful and false. I want nothing more to do with them. I hate all your festivals and sacrifices. I cannot stand the sight of them. From now on, when you lift up your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look. Even though you offer many prayers, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves and be clean. Let me no longer see your evil deeds. Give up your wicked ways. Learn to do good. Guys, do you get it? Listen, if you treat people like trash... I mean, if you're a jerk to your spouse, cruel with your kids, if you're always critical and condemning and cranky, if you're unkind and uncaring and just callous towards everybody else around you, but you still show up here on Sunday with your sacrifice, you're not pleasing God. It is a stench to God. We can be so unloving toward people Monday through Saturday, but then pretend to love God on Sunday, and God's not buying it. God's not having it. 
God wants us to do good and show mercy and be kind. And, and, and if we're doing none of the above, it, listen, it doesn't matter how much you put in the offering plate on Sunday or how loud you sing the songs or how well-dressed you come to church. That means nothing to God. God is not going to take any offering from you on Sunday when you've been giving people grief Monday through Saturday unless your offering is an offering of repentance. And some of us need to, be, need to stop the facade. Some of us need to be done with the fake and repent. God sees, God knows, He's not fooled. Be done with the show and repent. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to take a life? That was Jesus' question to the cruel, calloused Pharisees and it was the perfect question because what could they say? They, you know, they were trying to trap Jesus, but Jesus trapped them. He really did. If, if the Pharisees said that it's lawful to do good and, and to save a life on the Sabbath, then they're not going to be able to accuse Jesus of being a lawbreaker when he heals this guy with the withered right hand. But if the Pharisees said it was lawful to do harm and to kill on the Sabbath, then they would be lawbreakers themselves. They would actually be admitting to it, and that's something a legalist would never do, admit he's wrong. Everybody else is wrong, never the legalist. Jesus had them trapped, and so the Pharisees did the only thing they could. Look at the last four words in verse 4, the last sentence there. It says, but they were silent. Their silence condemns them. It proves that they thought it was better for a man to have his house burned to the ground, for a child to suffer with a broken leg, for a person to drown in a river, than for someone to break one of their Sabbath day rules. See, the Pharisees were wicked, and Jesus was angry. Notice this in verse 5. And Jesus looked around at them with anger. Just by show of hands, how many of you would agree that it takes a lot for Jesus to get angry? Right? He's long-suffering, abounding in love and mercy. Listen, the Pharisees tried, and they succeeded and it was only the Pharisees Jesus got angry with. Nowhere in the Gospels do we see Jesus getting angry with any tax collector or prostitute. Jesus only gets angry at the self-righteous, legalistic Pharisees. You know, tax collectors like Matthew and Zacchaeus, they at least admit their sin. Meanwhile, uh, the Pharisees thought they were better than everybody. Kind of like that Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 who stood up in the temple and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Jesus was angry with the Pharisees because of their pride. I'm the best, I'm the most, I'm the first. Pride is deceitful. It really is. In fact, pretty much all sin stems from pride and it angers Jesus. Jesus is right to be angry with the Pharisees' pride. I mean, Jesus is right to be angry with our pride. But guys, understand that Jesus is not just an angry God. He's so much more. Again, verse 5 and Jesus looked around at them with anger. But again, he's not just angry because look at the next word. What is it? Grieved. Jesus was angry at the Pharisees' pride, but he was also grieved. Notice verse 5 says, at their hardness of heart. Jesus was mad because, because in their pride, the Pharisees refused to admit that they were wrong and they refused to believe that Jesus was right, but Jesus was also sad because he knew that the Pharisees' stubborn refusal to believe would eventually take them to hell. Contrary to popular opinion, the Lord is not up in heaven laughing at people as they're being ushered down into the lake of fire. He is devastated, full of sorrow. The word anger in verse 5, Jesus looked around at them with anger. That's in the aorist tense in the Greek, which means this was a momentary anger, an isolated moment of anger. But the word for grieved in verse 5, in the Greek, it's in the present tense, which speaks of a continuous, ongoing sorrow. All that to say this, when Jesus looked at the Pharisees in the synagogue here in Mark chapter 3, he had a flash of anger. A moment of righteous anger. Jesus did not hold on to this anger. He didn't carry it around with him. He didn't hold a grudge. There wasn't any resentment or bitterness. This was an isolated incident of anger. But when it came to Jesus grieving over the Pharisees because of their hard hearts, well, this was something he always took with him. 
Jesus was continuously filled with pity, with sorrow and sadness for these Pharisees who were dead in their sin and they didn't even know it. And guys, this allows us to see the heart of Jesus a little better. He was momentarily righteously angry with the Pharisees' pride, but he was continuously, constantly grieving for the Pharisees because of where their pride would take them. And so, in his grieving, Jesus said to the man, guys, do you see that right there in the middle of verse 5? It says that Jesus said to the man. Again, Jesus is the one initiating the conversation. Jesus is the one taking the action. The man with the withered hand was just sitting there. He's just part of the crowd. This man knew that Jesus had the power to heal him, but he didn't ask for healing, which doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, if you, if you got a disability and you are in the presence of the great physician, right? You are in the presence of Jehovah Rophi, which means the God who heals. Listen, I'm asking for a miracle. I don't know about you. I, I'm, I pray all the time for Jesus to heal my knees. Okay, if I'm, if I'm this guy, I'm, I'm putting my dead hand in Jesus' face. I'm like, here you go. Do your thing. But the guy just sits there. Jesus has to approach him. Is it because the man was too afraid to ask for healing on the Sabbath because of what the Pharisees would do to him for breaking their rules? Possibly. Probably. Well, here's the thing about Jesus. He isn't afraid of the Pharisees or their rules. So he said to the man, verse 5, stretch out your hand. That's a scary thing to ask because if the man did that, the Pharisees could label him a Sabbath day violator and then banish him from the synagogue. But, but guys, when Jesus spoke those words with the authority that only he has, when Jesus said, stretch out your hand, Jesus' powerful voice was greater than the man's paralyzing fear. Jesus' powerful voice caused this man to believe that nothing is impossible for Jesus. And so the man stretched out his hand. Look at the last line of verse 5. He stretched out his hand, and his hand was restored. Immediately, numbness was gone, feeling returned, fingers uncurled, his grip was strong, instantly, totally healed. He didn't need to squeeze one of those... uh, Uh, stress balls for the next two weeks to regain his strength. He was all better, all at once. Because this is interesting, in healing this man on the Sabbath, the, the Pharisees were going to accuse Jesus of breaking God's law when, in fact, Jesus was fulfilling God's law. Jesus summed up God's law with these two commands. You remember what they are? The first and the greatest command Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said there is no other command greater than these. So when Jesus healed this man in the synagogue on the Sabbath, he was fulfilling the first and greatest command. Jesus was loving his Father by demonstrating God's mercy and compassion for this man who was made in his image. And Jesus was also fulfilling the second greatest command. He was loving his neighbor by reaching out and meeting a need. Okay, so by performing this miracle, Jesus was actually obeying the law. In healing this man, Jesus was loving his father and his neighbor. The Pharisees, the only people they loved were themselves. They knew nothing of love for God and love for neighbor. Again, they're the lawbreakers. Further proof of this is in verse 6. Look at that with me. It says, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel. Some of your translations may say that the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring. This is insane. Like, what more does Jesus need to do to convince them that he's the Son of God and the Savior of the world? The Pharisees just heard Jesus teach with authority. They just saw Jesus heal this guy's hand. This was such a tremendous display of divine power, and yet they had those hardened hearts, which is what continuously grieved Jesus. Jesus was so sad that the Pharisees wouldn't turn away from their unbelief and and receive him by faith. He was so sad because he knew where their unbelief would take them. 
The Pharisees stubbornly rejected God's word and God's son, and they stormed out of the synagogue in a fit of rage. They're conspiring to kill Jesus, which they would have killed him right there on the spot if it, if it wasn't for the crowd who was amazed by Jesus. So they, so they conspire together, but, but they're not alone. The, the Pharisees team up with another group. Again, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians. All right, the Pharisees and the Herodians, two very unlikely allies. The Herodians were an, uh, an irreligious, secular, carnal group of Jews who supported Rome, and in return, uh, Rome gave the Herodians political power. The Herodians were traitors to their own people. Rome oppressed the Jews. The Herodians, who were Jews, supported Rome. So think about it, guys. If the Pharisees hated tax collectors who were Jews hired by Rome to collect taxes, how do you think they felt about the Herodians? The Pharisees and the Herodians are arch enemies, and yet here they are in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, conspiring together. What united them? Their hatred of Jesus. That united them. The, the Pharisees hated Jesus because Jesus claimed he was God and he openly defied Judaism. Uh, the Herodians hated Jesus because his fame among the people made him a serious threat to the power of Rome. They, they hated Jesus for different reasons, but the end result was the same. Both the Pharisees and the Herodians rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior. Again, verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against Jesus. Do you see it there? They're, they're against Jesus. The Pharisees and the Herodians are against Jesus, whom Mark describes as the Son of God, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. The Pharisees and the Herodians are against Jesus, whom John the Baptist describes as the Lord, Mark 1.3. The Pharisees and the Herodians are against Jesus, whom God the Father describes as His beloved Son, Mark 1.11. The Pharisees and Herodians are against Jesus, whom the demons describe as the Holy One of God, Mark 1.24. They are against Jesus, the one who went around doing good. Jesus healed their sickness, cured their leprosy, gave sight to their eyes and hearing to their ears. He fed their bellies. They are against him. And here's what this looked like. Ultimately, the Pharisees and the Herodians wanted to destroy Jesus. It says that right there at the end of verse 6, the last four, four words, how to destroy him. Now, can you imagine that, wanting to destroy Jesus? Jesus, who has been described in this way, Listen, this is, who Je this is who Jesus is, the eternal, uncreated, self-existing, second person of the Godhead, the ancient of days, he who was from everlasting to everlasting, worshipped by the highest archangels of glory, the theme of the seraphim song, the creator and sustainer of the universe, God over all, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, blessed forever, the Pharisees want to destroy him. They'd have a better chance trying to destroy the universe. MacArthur says the storm clouds, the storm clouds had now begun to gather on the horizon, and they would soon break over Jesus on a hillside outside Jerusalem called Golgotha, where he would voluntarily give his life. But even in death, Jesus Christ would triumph, paying the penalty for sin and rising from the dead in victory. Guys, what else can you expect from the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Death cannot defeat him, and the grave cannot hold him. He is Lord and Savior. And so let me, let me just ask you this question. What are you going to do with Jesus when you leave here? See, you, you've been confronted with the reality of who Jesus is. He is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. He is Lord to whom we must all give an account. That's who Jesus is. And so when you get up and go out, what are you going to do? See, the Pharisees went out and conspired. They got up and, and they continued in their stubborn unbelief. They continued to harden their hearts and they went out conspiring against Jesus how to destroy him. They rejected Jesus. And for those of you 
here this morning, I know I'm not talking to everybody, but for those of you who've heard the truth of who Jesus is from the Word and you have yet to believe it, will you go out and continue in your unbelief? If so, you are in the process of hardening your heart and that grieves Jesus because it's your stubborn, hard heart that will send you straight to the pit of hell. And maybe you're thinking, well, you know, at least I don't, I don't hate Jesus like the Pharisees did. Listen to me, unbelief is unbelief. Unbelief is unbelief. The Pharisees hated Jesus, and by doing that, they rejected Jesus. You may, you may be someone who respects Jesus. You just don't believe he is who he said he is. You don't believe uh, what the Bible says he is. Do you get it, guys? That's still a rejection of Jesus. Whether you hate him or respect him, it doesn't matter. If you don't believe in him as Lord and Savior, you've rejected him. In both the Jesus haters and the Jesus respecters, their unbelief will get them to the same place. And as we've seen from the text this morning, that breaks Jesus' heart. So I plead with you, repent of your sin and receive Jesus by faith. That is the only appropriate response. It's what Jesus demands, and it's what He deserves. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for another clear demonstration of who Jesus is. God, thank You for giving us Your Word, which is truth. And so we can open it up and read it, and we don't have to wonder if what we're seeing is right, if it's real, if it's true. It is, God, because You have said it. And it is impossible for you to lie. So God, we thank you for the reality and the truth of who Jesus is. He is your son. He is our savior. He is Lord. And Jesus, we are so thankful for the way that you initiated everything with us. Like the man with the withered hand, we were all diseased. We were all disabled, handicapped, dead in our sin. We didn't even know to ask for healing. And yet, Jesus, you saw us and you had compassion and you came to us and you did the work. You died on the cross. You rose again so that we can be forgiven, so that we can have eternal life. And all we have to do is receive that by faith. God, thank you for the gospel, the gospel of grace, the free gift of God that is eternal life found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. If there is somebody here this morning who has yet to receive that by faith, God, I pray that they would respond, that they would repent, that they would believe. Because in rejecting this message and rejecting another gospel invitation, they are hardening their hearts even more. That not only breaks my heart, it breaks yours, God. I pray that salvation would happen in your house today. I ask this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.